John, we're in the EBAT factory it makes washing machines here. It's a massive factory, hundreds of people work here. But how did this business start? Oh, a long time ago, um, it, really, I was a bit reckless. I was uh, 28 year old, two young children, not much, not many savings. I did have a basic business there, which was selling eggs, which was a very small business, which formed the, how we started it. So that gave us the administration side of it. We were dealing with banks and things. It is hard to believe that back in 1972, Banks didn't have departments doing the small businesses, governments didn't. It's hard to believe now, mm. all these things are there now, but then it didn't exist, so we just got on with it. A bit risky really, but cavalier. I always was confident that I would uh, be able to make a living, and proved to be the case. Now you didn't start making washing machines, it was a bit more niche, wasn't it, the well, products? I, I remember one interesting thing, which I still recall now, back in the very early days, the three brothers had started the business, well two of us actually, um, were in Darlington, Peter with Stevenson's, buying a MIG welder. It was £48 and we debated for an hour. We spent £7 million pounds here and no one even asked me about it. <laughs> That's the difference. And you you were making domestic or building dryers? The very first point was a building dryer. Another interesting point about innovation actually, I met a guy in Derby who wanted a, a building dryer. He's part of the Bovis group and he couldn't get one to work very well. So he asked me to design one, and I did literally on the back of a fact packet. And I had a clever idea to separate the heat exchangers. So this piece of equipment could not only be a dehumidifier, but also an air cooler. So the same bit of plant could be converted for about a cost of five pounds into an air cooler. Great innovation. Right. Um, and no one ever bought the kit. So sometimes being clever doesn't work. People in business like simplicity. And people said, yes, we'll, we'll buy the cooler separately. Sometimes you can be too clever. But you did diversify. You did dehumidifiers to dry buildings out when they've got condensation and damp, and then moved in. And, and all around the country and in America, if you see an office water cooler, it could have been made here. That's right. It, it, we've always had the same philosophy. What we've always tried to do is satisfy customers. A lot very early, actually. If the customer doesn't buy your product, you don't eat. And that's a, that's a start. It seems obvious, but it isn't until you really sit there and thinking. And we, we used to do contracts with people like the, uh, the um, railways, where it was all contractually driven, nothing to do with the customer, and that was totally different. When you deal with the end users, if they don't buy your product, you don't eat. So that was one thing. We always try and satisfy the customer, figure out what they like and what they don't like, and always plow back in the album of cash in the investment, even on the first day. So we make some money, buy a bit more plan. We bought the first bit of equipment which was affording uh, 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 Gillespie, and always reinvesting, and that's why. We still have got the culture, we like to make things. More than most companies, we make plastic mouldings in here, make our own pretty circuit boards, metal fabrication, and assembly. Now they're making bits for washing machines, anyone can see the front door of a washing machine there. What made you think you should make washing machines? Surely people buy them from abroad now, well, and they, it's cheap as chips. They, unfortunately they do. Now what we, it was Pamela's idea, my daughter actually, she said, we're good at designing things, and we are. We're quite good at figuring out. That's why we sell more dehumidifiers, and more water coolers than most. We said those are niche products with small volume. If we can use the same skill in the bigger product, we can get greater volume and greater use of the our innovation ideas. So that's where it came from. Let's have a look round somewhere else. This is an example of an EBAC philosophy where we need a heat exchanger, something to transfer heat when cooling water coolers. So that bit of kit you've got there is going to be in, in millions of water coolers in offices around the world. Yes, yeah, millions. What, what, did, what made you think of getting into water coolers? Water coolers have been in the USA again for 50, 60 years. They've only been here a relatively short time and we introduced them into Europe. There's three people went to the USA and came back with the idea of renting water coolers and selling water and they asked us to make a water cooler because what was important to them was at the time when there was a problem with Perrier water. Going back quite a few years. Yeah, yeah, in the 1980s. The late 80s, early 90s it would be, probably late 80s. And so they said we want something that's very hygienic. That was the very that was the thing that had the problem. So we designed, unique to us, a water trail which made it very hygienic. So and they came to us, asked us to make that, and off it went. And you know, people sell talk about selling coals to Newcastle or selling sand to the Arabs. The idea of the water cooler is American, and now where are you selling your water coolers? That's right, that's our new market actually. We're selling quite a lot of coolers now at the USA market. I think it's going to get bigger as well. Our biggest market for water coolers today is France, followed by Italy and then Spain. UK is less now because it's 
the market's almost full here, and we only sell water coolers if the market increases, and they do last a long time, fortunately or unfortunately. So we don't sell as many in the UK now because the market's pretty well saturated. Um, so, yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, look around and see what else we can see. John Elliott, you own the business that makes these washing machines, the only washing machine manufacturing firm in the UK. But it's not just you, it's all family as well, isn't it? Well, it might surprise you. I'm not going to answer your question here, Graham, but it, I don't own the business anymore. Good point. The business is owned by... Ten years ago, we put all the shares were gifted to a foundation so the business would stay here forever. There's no private ownership. It can never be sold or moved. We've got to keep manufacturing in the North East, and that was the intention of that foundation. So... You're so committed to manufacturing jobs, you would stop yourself being able to become a multi, multi, multi-millionaire by selling this off to some big international company. When businesses succeed, and we've had success and we've had failure as well, we've been around a long time, so we've been through good and bad times, uh, there's always people wanting to buy the business. It was never for sale. There are more stakeholders in the business than the people who've got the shares. Mm -hmm. And it's employees and potential employees as well. I'm not saying we're going to be soft on employees, we've got to manage the business effectively, but we've got to be fair as well. Our main value, in fact, in EBAC is fairness. Mm. We discussed this a long time. Actually. What's the number one value? We dismissed honesty fairly early, actually, <laughs> because I don't mind people telling me I'm handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think lying to the intent is more important than the content. But being fair is very important. And that doesn't mean being soft either. It means I'm fair to you, you're fair to me. Employees are fair to each other and fair to the company, and the company's fair to the employees. Fairness is our number one value. You have all sorts of sort of crazy things at first that make sense when you put them in. For instance, you have your employees don't have sort of set times to work. It's more annual hours. How does that work? Well, you're right, actually. We use annual hours. We've used them a long time before that name was used because we just use common sense. We just, you know, we don't have a system here where we, we never, gender's never an issue mm. or religion or anything. It's merit. It's all about looking at people for what they can do. We, we're a simple business. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a culture, for example, where we have a no-blame culture, which people think that's crazy. It isn't. If someone makes a mistake, they will probably worry about it more than they should. Mm. They don't mean me to get on the back as well. They want me to say, don't worry about it. Because you know, you're just taking the strength away. What you do, the question you ask is, can this person do the job? Mm -hmm. Now, if they can't do the job and made a mistake, then it's a training issue or a redeployment issue. Mm. And what about the, the family? You, you've had your family in, uh, daughters, son-in-laws and things like that. You, but it's not all about the family. Uh, I, I know that you sometimes fall out with them. It's not all plain sailing. No, no, we, we, we started off with the brothers, actually, and, and Margaret's always been involved in the business. Because when you start a business with nothing, and it really was nothing, um, you know, you, that's when you really learn, when, mm. when you're facing reality at the cold face. So it was brothers to start with, and then as my children got older, uh, they've, all of them have be, been in the business at different times. There's only one left here now. Uh, Pam, they've all been here at different times, and they've gone up to do other things. So you've got um, Amanda works in here Amanda's now. here now running production. Mm -hmm. But I do think of the, it's an, more of an EBAC family than an Elliott family as well. You know, right. there's, there's people who've been here. There's, there's families here, uh, children and parents, you know. It, there's something about it. We are unique, you're absolutely right. And that's why people fit in here or they don't. You also started this in the 1970s. And, you know, you obviously look like a spring chicken now. <laughs> you're in your 70s yourself. Uh, retiring? Are you no, going to retire? No, 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 no. Um, What's your attitude I, I, to retire? I've retired three times, actually, but it's a bit like Frank Sinatra, you know, uh, the last retirement. The first retirement, which was probably when I was only about 65 or something, but I decided to come back to work, actually, to be closer to the family. So, uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah, retirement. Men, all people, but men mainly, need a sense of purpose. Mm. You need a sense of purpose. And it doesn't mean it's all roses and it's good all the time. There'll be times when it's very frustrating and you think, why am I doing this? Do I need to do this? But I think we just do need a sense of purpose. Um, people in the north of England, maybe not people watching this, uh, know you're very well known because you, you get yourself into public uh, debates. You were the advocate for Brexit in the north where it voted strongest for Brexit. Um, did you not think that would uh, def d d damage your brands and things? Well, it, it did a bit, you see. But I think uh, another thing I believe in, actually, Business is here to serve people, not the other way around. Of course I want to make EPAC successful, I want to try and make it successful. But the real reason, the real purpose of business is, is to actually uh, serve the people. The people aren't here to serve business. And I sometimes think the government think it is. They're worried more about growing the economy, which is good for business rather than good for people.